I think you'll see that this next method in partial fractions is extremely similar to the first. If you can do one, if you can do method one, you can do method two. The reason I'm stopping at method two is the other three methods, I don't want to say are significantly harder, but they're significantly longer problems. And I think this test is already going to be long enough. Uh, plus, I want to spread the fun of partial fractions over two examples. So that, that was kind of my ul ul ulterior motive. Uh, but this is section 7-5, method 2. Why did I write out 2 like that? I don't know. Um, so I, I guess. Um, so method 2 is when the denominator... has a repeated linear factor. Now, in pre-cal, we looked at things like this, and we called them multiplicities. A graph has a multiplicity of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Whenever it has a factor that's raised to a power, like, for example, if I said, can you just real quickly graph for me the function x minus 5 squared times x plus 1? You'd say, well, yeah, it's very easy to graph because you have it factored out. Uh, it has an x-intercept at 5, but you know, yes, that's a linear factor, but it's a repeated linear factor. That has a consequence graphically. You'll say it is not going to cross at x equals 5. Instead, it's only going to touch and go back in the direction. We call this double multiplicity, or multiplicity 2. And then at x equals negative 1, we say, yeah, it's just normal x-intercept. It crosses there. So you'd say, I know my graph has an x-intercept there and 1 at 5. We know it's just a positive cubic, so it starts low, finishes high. So I'd say, well, okay, it's going to start down here. It's going to cross through at negative 1. Go up here to some point. Reach a maximum in between negative 1 and 5. And then you'll say, but at 5, because of that double multiplicity, it only touches, goes back in the direction that we came from. Okay. Now, I wanted to show that just because... Oftentimes when people look at this, they say, but no, that's a quadratic factor. No, it's a repeated linear factor. The factor solution is x minus 5 is a factor. It's just that that factor occurs twice. And we see that has an impact in the way the graph looks. It also has an impact in the way we work problems. Uh, so, for example, um, let's say I give you the equation. I'll say I want to find the integral of... Uh, let's say 5x squared minus 3x plus 2. All of this integrated with respect to x. Over the denominator, I'll say x cubed minus 2x squared. So you say, well, okay, first of all, it's not factored, so uh, factor the denominator. There's no need to factor the numerator. I'll say this is just the integral of 5x squared minus 3x plus 2 with respect to x. In the denominator, we can easily see, well, it has a common factor, greatest common factor of x squared. Whenever you factor that out, you'll be left with x minus 2. So what this is telling me is that I have a linear factor of x that occurs twice. The solution here is x equals 0 and x equals 2 if I were uh, finding where this, uh, quad, sorry, where this rational function does not exist. What I'll do now is I'll algebraically look at that fraction on the inside, 5x squared minus 3x plus 2. Those are x squared times x minus 2. All you're going to do, you're going to set up a fraction for every power of this linear factor. If it were an x to the fifth, you would say, well, that's a over x plus b over 
uh, x squared plus c over x cubed plus d over x to the fourth. You would have to do it five times. In this case, it's not that bad. You just say a over x plus b over x squared. And then you'll say plus c over x minus 2. That's all we have to do. And so now uh, you'd say, well, okay, at this point in the problem, I need to solve for a, b, and c. So I'll say, well, I know I could multiply by my least common denominator, which is going to be x squared times x minus 2. When I do that, I know my left-hand side is going to give me 5x to the second minus 3x plus 2. On the right-hand side, I'll say, okay, I need to multiply all of this by that. When I multiply a over x by this group, I will get a times x, x times x minus 2. Then when I multiply b over x squared times all of this, I get b times x minus 2. Isn't it a times x squared times x minus 2? No, because it's a divided by x times this least common denominator. Yeah, I dropped the x. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So you always, always multiply by this. This is the least common denominator. When I take this, multiply, because notice, that's how I got this on the left-hand side. I'm only multiplying by this. If I say, if I multiply a over x times this, that x cancels one of these x's out. But I'm still left with a times x times x minus 2. Would it be b over x times x minus 2? No, because here's the least common denominator. This x squared cancels that x squared, and I'm left with b times x minus 2. Right, because you're dividing it on the left side. So if you need to show this, guys, please do. What I'm doing is I'm multiplying by x squared times x minus 2 here. Okay. So when you do that, this x cancels out one of those, leaves me with a times x times x minus 2. When I divide by x squared, it cancels out that entirely, and I'm left with b times x minus 2. Here, this x minus 2 is going to cancel that x minus 2, and I'll be left with cx squared. Did you get the a over x from back, like... From factoring the x that's, the that's, that's the rule for, okay. so, so like what I was trying to say earlier, if, and, and I, I did, I got the x squared from factoring the denominator, I said x squared times x minus 2, but the point I was trying to make here is that what this rule is telling me, that whatever the power on this factor is, that's how many times you have to write it here. So if this would have been an x cubed down there, if I'd have had some polynomial over x cubed, I'd have to say, well, that's a over x plus b over x squared plus c over x cubed. Oh, okay. One for each power. That's the only thing that differentiates this, <laughs> differentiates, uh, from our first technique that we talked about. Everything was always to the first power. But you see, you see how c is cx, cx, then x. No, it, I'm multiplying by this, so that x minus 2 cancels that x minus 2, cx squared. Okay. You just All it is is multiplying by the least common denominator. Now, once you do that, you say, okay, I want an expression that does not have an a or a b. Then let x equal 2. If x is 2, this term is 0, this term is 0. So I'll say x equals 2 gives me what? On the left, I'll have 5 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2. On the right, I can ignore my a and b. Those will be 0. I'll have c times 2 squared. So c4. Uh, now, over here, I'll have 5 times 4 is 20. Minus 6 is 14. Plus 2 is 16. I'm getting 16 is 4 times C. So C is 4. Now that I can see what C is, <coughs> stop, stop. Uh, it kind of helps me solve for uh, A and B, although I have other ways to solve for A and B. I could eliminate A and C 
by letting x equal 0. That would allow me to solve for b. So I'll say let x equal 0. What's the left-hand side of your expression? You just have a 2. These two terms would cancel. And you'd say 2 is equal to, here if you let x equal 0, a times 0. Uh, if you let x equal 0 here, you get negative 2b. And that would be c times 0. So I get negative 2b is 2. That tells me b is equal to 2 over negative 2, negative 1. I have my solution for c. I have my solution for b. Uh, I need a solution for a. Now, unfortunately, when I let x equal 0 or x equals 2, it's going to eliminate every time and eliminate the a term. So I kind of like an expression to solve for a. Uh, what I know is that a is being multiplied by x squared minus 2x. All I did is I just foiled that out. And so now, here's what I'm going to do. I know that the only coefficients of an x squared term on the right, please notice where I'm getting this from, the only coefficients of an x squared term that I'll get are an a plus c x squared. So I can say a plus c must be what, guys? What's my coefficient of x squared on the left? Well, 5x squared. Five. So I can say, now please note, how did I know? Those are my only coefficients of x squared, because b is only a coefficient of x. c is a coefficient of x squared. a will be a coefficient of x squared. So I can say a plus c must equal 5. Fortunately for me, I already knew that c had to equal 4. So a plus 4 is 5. Thus, a is 5 minus 4. a is 1. Okay, so I have my solutions for A, B, and C. We are ready to solve this problem. Just like the problems with partial fractions that we did uh, last week, once you get it set up, it's going to be pretty direct. I can say all of this is equal to A over X, 1 over X, plus the integral. I can always separate up any sum. b over x squared. Well, that's negative 1 over x squared. I'll go ahead and put it as that right now, negative 1 over x squared, just to make it clear where it's coming from. Plus c over x minus 2. Here's c. So I can say, well, that's going to be plus integral 4 over x minus 2 with respect to x. Now, every single one of these, or ooh, actually not every single one, anytime I can look at the denominator and say, is the derivative of the denominator in the numerator, it's a natural log. If I can't do that, it's not a natural log. The first one, derivative of x is 1 with respect to that is a natural, that's just natural log of x. Done with the first term. What about the second one? No. Right. You say, well, that's just negative 1 x to the negative 2. If you're thinking about integrating that, you say, well, when I integrate, I add 1 to the exponent. That's going to make it negative 1 x to the negative 1 divide by that new exponent, negative 1. And so you say, oh, well, that's going to be plus x to the negative 1. Plus x to the negative 1 is plus 1 over x. All that second integral becomes plus 1 over x. Okay. Now, the, the third one, 4 over x minus 2, you say, well, the derivative of x minus 2 is 1. So this is nothing more than a constant multiple of 4 times the natural log of x minus 2. <coughs> plus the constant integration. Okay, so now, just to show you that 
I can't create a tough problem with one of these. And I don't want to do one that I've created. I want you all to tell me our next example problem. So number two from you guys. Give me a uh, quadratic uh, equation with, let's keep it nice, uh, with whole number coefficients. I don't want something like the square root of 2x squared minus cube root of 3. That, that would make for a, I start to say a hard, but an, an interesting problem. Uh, we want a nice one. Yeah, go ahead. Quadratic. Uh, no, 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 I can't do that. Sure you can. Plus two, X plus one. Go ahead, Zach. Say the... X squared plus 2X plus 1. <laughs> That's a little too easy. Or put a 9 in front of X squared. Yeah. You said 9? Yeah. Okay. It's still a per... No, 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 it's not a perfect square. I thought it was. It was before. Okay. Now what I want are... Let's say, let's say three linear factors, and one of them, ooh, do you want to make one to the third power? No. Or, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. I do. So give me a linear factor to the third power. How about 4x cubed <laughs> minus 5? Yeah, let's go with hers. <laughs> okay. You think that'll make it harder? No, it won't. Well, yeah, it will. It'll make it interesting <laughs> You said 4x minus 5 cubed? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. So, what we would do is you just algebraically think of this. Now, the uh, algebra part of this might be a little messy. I may not be able to do my nice little tricks here. That's no big deal. I'll just put it into a matrix and solve it. You can always use a matrix. Come on, uh, so. Can we change that 5 to like an 8 or something? Or I don't know, something no, else. No, I'm, I'm, no. I like the 5. Um, so, too late. I'm stuck with it. 9x squared plus 2x plus 1 over 4x minus 5. I want to be cute. So I can say, that is a linear factor to a power. What my method of partial fractions would tell me to do, anytime you have a linear factor to a power, is the derivative of any linear is a constant. So it'll just say, it's a constant term in the numerator over the first power of this, plus a constant term in the numerator over the second power of this, plus a constant term in the numerator over the third power of this. Okay. Now, once we do that, you can say, well, all right, we'll multiply this out. Clearly, the least common denominator is 4x minus 5 to the third. So your left-hand side is going to become 9x squared plus 2x plus 1. Your right-hand side, you'll have 80 times you're still going to have 4x minus 5 to the second power with that term. b times 4x minus 5. Oh, this is actually going to work out very nicely, you see. <laughs> see? Um, so you'd say, okay, what do I want to let x equal to cancel out a and b? Well, if you let x equal 5 fourths, each of those groups would be 4 times 5, 4 which is 5, 5 minus 5 is 0. So I would say let x equal 5 fourths. Doesn't make for as nice of a problem, but that almost makes it more nice. The fact that it's not nice. But I know that's weird. Uh, 9 times 5 fourths squared plus 2 times 5 fourths plus 1. That has to equal... Uh, the, the only thing I have on the right hand side is C. Because everything else will cancel out. So this will give me 9 times 25 over 16 plus 10 over 4 plus whoop, 10 over 4 plus 1. Is, uh, so that's going to give me. Uh, 9 times 25, 225 over 16.
then I would get, uh, I'd need to multiply the force of 40 over 16 plus 16 over 16. It's going to give me 265 plus 6, 281 over 16. So now, at this point in the problem, it's going to be a little harder to work with A and B. That's okay, though. I already know what C is, uh, and C is my constant. Please notice, if I were to say, well, I'm going to think of this A a little bit more. It's A times, so my left-hand side was 9x squared plus 2x plus 1. If you squared out 4x minus 5 quantity squared, you say, well, when that's squared, you get 4x times 4x. 16x to the second, you get 4x times negative 5 is minus 20x. You'd have to do that twice. It's going to be minus 40x, negative 5 times negative 5 plus 25, plus b times 4x minus 5. I already know c is 281 over 16. So there's no need to put c when I already know what c is. Now, what I would like to do is uh, say, clearly, A is the only term that can be a coefficient of an x squared term. In fact, I know that 16A is going to be the coefficient of x squared. I go to the other side and say, well, the coefficient of x squared is a 9. There's my solution. Do you see where I'm getting that from, guys? No. So... If you were to multiply this out on the right-hand side, distribute that A through here. Now, this is a step that's not necessary, but if you need to see it, it is. You get 16A x squared minus 40A times x plus 25A. We'll distribute the b through this group. You get plus 4bx minus 5b plus 281 over 16. Now, since I see this side is coefficient times x squared plus coefficient times x plus a constant, let's group my other side correspondingly. What's my coefficients of x squared? There's only one, 16a. Plus, I have a coefficient of x on the left. I'd like to see a coefficient of x on the right. My coefficients of x are going to be negative 40a plus 4b. Those are coefficients of x. Then I'm thinking, well, I see a 1. That's a constant on the left. What are my only possible constant terms on the right? Well, I had a C, which I could have said, well, C is a constant, and I already found out what it was, 281 over 16. My only other term that could be a constant, or, or, oh, sorry, actually, there's more than one term. Uh, 25A minus 5B. And I could put plus C, but I already know what C is, so I'll put plus 281 over 16. So now, instead of working with this one, that would be pretty ugly, I'd say, I know 25a minus 5b plus 281 over 16 equals 1. That'd be hard to work with. This one's easy to work with. I can say, there is only one coefficient of x squared on the right-hand side. There's my coefficient of x squared on the left. Thus, 16a has to be 9. So a is 9 over 16. Then you use that answer to solve for b. You know, here's the coefficients of x on the right-hand side. Here's the coefficient of x on the left, 2. What I'm 100% certain is that negative 40a plus 4b, that has to be the coefficient of x. That's 2. So I go into it and say, well... Uh, negative 40 times a, negative 40 times a, which is 9 over 16, 
plus 4b, that's what I'm solving for now, b, is equal to 2. So negative 40 times 9 over 16, uh, 40 over 16, uh, that'll reduce down to negative 5 over 2. Uh, and then times 9 is going to be negative 45 over 2. When I move it to the right hand side, positive 45 over 2. And I can say, well, 2 is the same thing as 4 over 2. Oh, that's going to be gorgeous. 49 over 2. No, that's not gorgeous. I was thinking I needed to take the square root, but I'm not. <laughs> But it's gorgeous in its ugliness. So I'm getting 4b is 2. So b is going to equal 49 over 2 divided by 4, which is 49 over 8. So if I try to make a hard problem, the only thing hard is the algebraic part. It's almost impossible for me to give you a technique like this and make it hard on the calculus part because now all I have to do is go back in and say, okay, this group is equal to the integral. A over 4 minus x. 9 over 16 over 4 minus x. Sorry, 4 minus x. 4x minus 5. dx plus b this one actually is going to be a little more interesting than I was thinking. Uh, B is our 49 over 8 over 4x minus 5 squared plus C, which C was our 281 over 16 over 4x minus 5 cubed. Something that I neglected to do on the second one is put my dx, I'll put it up in the numerator. Now, I would have suggested, and the reason I didn't do it is because I wanted you to see that all I'm doing is I'm writing as the integral of the first one plus integral of the second one plus integral of the third one. Now, thinking ahead though, if I were just working this problem on my own, I know these fractions are not going to be beneficial. I would have preferred just to go ahead and factor them out in that step myself. I think it's easier to see like this, but I can also see there's, that 9 over 16 is not going to be helpful. Move it out. And then you'd say, well, is the derivative of the denominator, oh, gorgeousness. Would you want to do a U substitution in each of these? Or are you okay with me bypassing that? Yes! Okay, here's what we'll do. So I'll say, okay, I have a 9 over 16, and then I'm thinking 1 over 4x minus 5 dx minus 49 over 8. I'm going to write this as the group 4x minus 5 to the negative 2. plus 281 over 16 on the integral of 4x minus 5 to the negative 3 dx. Okay, now the fact that these all had to be linear factors to a, to a uh, power makes it extremely easy to integrate. So I'd say, okay, I'm going to work backwards over here. Why are you doing that minus? Because it's on the bottom. Yes. I had oh, to do a negative exponent because it's on the bottom. 49 over 8. Oh, because I made a mistake. Or was it negative? No. 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 Good question. Why indeed? Now, I think I was thinking ahead, but that's not good. Uh, the first one. You'd say, well... Clearly, it's a natural law. Why is it clearly a natural law? You'd say, is the derivative of the denominator in the numerator? No. Could I put the derivative of the denominator in the numerator? Yeah. There we go. Fixed. <laughs> so, but no. If you multiply by 4 on the inside, then what do you have to do out here? Divide by 4. It's going to become 
9 over 64 times the natural log of 4x minus 5. Now remember, that 4 in the numerator is gone. If you did a u substitution, you'd say, let u equal 4x minus 5, du would be 4x dx. That's gone. Please do not think that needs to be part of your answer. When I go to the next term, I'm thinking, okay, how do I integrate something to a power? Well, I add 1 to the exponent. So when I'm thinking, of, I'm going to just do a little bit of scrap work here. 49 over 8. 4x minus 5 to the negative 2. I'm thinking, okay, the 49 over 8 goes along with it. Then anytime I integrate a group to a power, it's going to be that group. Add 1 to the power. Divide by that new power. Is that all? Also what then? Divide by the derivative of the inside. So I'm going to be dividing by negative 4. When I divide by negative 4, it's going to make this a negative 49 over 32. So I'll say minus 49 over 32. And, ooh, oh, ooh, this group needs to be in the denominator to the first power. So I'll just put that down with a 32. That's what I'll do. 4x minus 5. Gorgeous. It'd be more gorgeous if I moved my 49 over. Now it's gorgeous. You okay, Daniel? So what I was thinking of is 49 over 8. If I'm dividing by a negative 4, I'm multiplying by a negative 1 over 4. Like that. Now my last term, I have 281 over 16 times the group 4x minus 5 to the negative 3. It's going to become 281 over 16 times the group 4x minus 5 to the negative 2 power divided by that new exponent and divided by the derivative of what was inside of that linear function. So you say, well, that's going to be dividing by 8, uh, 16 times 8, uh, 144. Uh, 281, and it's going to be negative 281, so I'll say minus 281 over 144. Oh, 16 times 8 is 1, oh, no, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow, arguing. I did it with the calculator. <laughs> yeah. You're wrong. No, I'm not. I'm looking at it. Thank you. 128. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, 6 times 8 is 48 plus 80. Thank gosh. Uh, uh, now, that's going to be 4x minus 5 squared. Plus C. Yeah. Um, over here where you had negative 40a plus 4b equals 2, how did you get that part? So, that's what I did here, Clint. In this step... <coughs> So this a times 4x minus 5 quantity squared, squared, 4x minus 5 squared was 16x squared minus 40x plus 25. Then I had b times 4x minus 5. What this helps you realize is what the coefficients of each term needs, needs to be. Like the first thing I did, even from looking at this step, without distributing, I can say the only coefficient of an x squared term is going to come from, I'll have a 16a x squared. That has to equal 9x squared over here. So I say, oh, then 16a has to equal 9. Now, similarly with the x's, let's say, what are the only coefficients of x I'll have on the right? Well, I have a times negative 40x. I have b times a 4x. When I distributed, and I showed that out in the next step, I have my minus 40ax plus 4bx. So these two are my coefficients. Of, I'm collecting all my coefficients of x. 4b minus 48. Negative 48 plus 4bx, that has to equal the coefficient of x on the left, which is 2. Okay. All right. Now, I think you'll see that 
That problem's significantly harder than what I'll expect of you. Although I like that one, give me ideas. Let's just go at it. Uh, so problems one through four. Notice on this, guys, I tried to make these first four problems so basic that there will be no integration. If there are integration problems in this, you have problems. Uh, so uh, the, the integration should not be any struggle whatsoever on these first ones. Uh, it's just if you can get it set up, it's going to be easy to work. Uh, so in this one I said, please notice, it's the same region for all four problems. I want, I'm wanting them to go quickly as possible. So one through four, let's just go ahead and graph our region. It's the region bounded from zero to two of x cubed. So you know x cubed goes up to the point two a, starts at zero, zero. So this is my region right here. Now, what am I doing to this region in number one? In number one, I'm rotating it about the x-axis. So I'll go ahead and say, well, this is just, I'll go ahead and just do that for number one. I'll say, okay, I'm rotating it about the x-axis. Now, anytime you rotate about a horizontal axis, my recommendation is that you use the slicing method. So you'll say, I'll cut this region into infinitely many slices. Each of the slices is going to arbitrarily look something like this. It will have a given thickness, and that given thickness is going to be a change in the x-axis, which is why I recommended slicing. I have a question. All right. <laughs> so on our test, do we have to draw the pictures? No. But I think it's helpful if you do. You don't count off if we draw really badly. This is pretty bad. Uh, I mean... So, I'll say my radius here is x cubed. So I'd say, what's volume of a particular slice? You'd say, well, volume of the slice is area of the face of the slice times the thickness of the slice. Area of the face is going to be pi r squared. pi x cubed squared times the thickness delta x. So depressingly, we're pretty much done with number one. You'd say, so the volume of this entire rotated region is going to be where the region begins in terms of x to where the region ends in terms of x. And you'd say, well, it starts at x equals 0, it ends at x equals 2. So, And I'll go ahead and factor the pi out. <coughs> pi times the integral 0 to 2. x cubed squared is going to be x to the 6th dx. So like I said, the integration part on these should be pretty quick, should be pretty easy. Uh, x to the 7th over 7 in this case. Evaluate it from 0 to 2. That's what we do. Uh, it's say 2 to the 7th is 128, 128 pi over 7. Of course, when you evaluate it at 0, you get 0, that's why I ignored it. <laughs> Number 1 done. Number 2, I'm taking that exact same region, rotating it about the y-axis. Anytime you rotate about a vertical axis, I would recommend the shell method. I'm not saying you have to. These functions will be so simplistic you really could use either. But I'll use shell. That way I can keep everything in terms of x. He would want us to at least show what shell method so we can know. No, I, I won't even say that. Not putting any unless you want me to put restriction. <laughs> No, I would, I would like it, Brian. I just don't want to make it this time. I use shell method for number two. Well, you'd really be punishing yourself, actually. True. Mm, that's it. Well, you do. 
So now I'll say, okay, here's my shell. I know that that shell has a thickness of delta x because it's a change in distance on the x-axis. I could say if I ripped that shell open, then one arbitrary shell is going to be nothing more than a rectangular solid. That rectangular solid also has a thickness of x, cc, delta x. Then I could say, well, I know that the height of the shell is simply the height of the curve at any point in the shell. The height of that curve is a y value of x cubed. So right there I go. I know that the length of that arbitrary shell is nothing more than the circumference of the circle that, 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 you, part, that, that you pulled apart the shell from. Well, at this point, the circumference comes from the radius of the circle, and that's the distance from the y-axis, which is going to be x. So this is nothing more than circumference formula 2 pi r, which in this case is 2 pi x. So I can say the volume of an arbitrary shell is equal to length times width times height 2 pi x times x cubed with respect to x. So that'll give me 2 pi x to the fourth dx, or sorry, delta x. Now, I'll just, I need to sum every possible shell from where the shells would begin in terms of x to where the shells end in terms of x. Just like the last one, x goes from 0 to 2. So I'll say the volume of the region in terms of x, or you could just say v equals, I'll pull the 2 pi out, and I'll say it's the integral from 0 to 2 of x to the fourth dx. When I integrate this, I'll get x to the fifth over 5. So 2 pi times x to the fifth over 5. <coughs> Evaluated from 0 to 2. 2 to the fifth power is 32. We'll get uh, 2 pi times 32 over 5. going to give me 64 pi over 5. <clears throat> number 1 and number 2, done. Number 3, it's the same region about the, about the line y equals 10. So I'll say, okay, I'll just try to uh, show this a little more carefully here. Here's my region. And it tops off at 2, 8. I'll take this and rotate it about the horizontal line, y equals 10. So y equals 10, horizontal line right up here. We are, this is our axis of rotation. Anytime it's a horizontal axis of rotation, I recommend the slicing method. Using the slicing method, in this case, you'd have to say, well, there's going to be an interior radius that you have to hollow out. I'll call that R1. And an exterior radius that's going all the way down to this part, I'll call that R2. Okay. So each of my slices is going to be a washer. where I have that R1 and R2 value in here. I can say, well, okay, R1. I need to make sure that my radial lengths are positive. How would I ensure that R1 is a positive? Absolute value. <laughs> well, that would do it. Uh, but, I, but I don't want to use an absolute value because absolute values are tricky to integrate with. Any any y value on this curve is greater than or less than 10. It's less than 10. So I just say, well, r1 is the distance from here to here, and I need it to be positive. So 10 minus whatever this y value is. What is that y value? x cubed. So r1 is 10 minus x cubed. r2, what's r2? 
10 minus 0, 10. Thank you. 10. So now I can say, okay, the volume of a particular slice. I used to do this, but I, it got messy. I, I can do it. Volume of a slice. I like it. Uh, volume of a slice would look like, I could say, well, it's going to be pi. You could say it's pi r squared uh, or pi r2 squared minus pi r1 squared. Or just uh, pull the pi out and say it's pi times r2 squared, 10 squared, minus r1 squared, 10 minus x cubed squared. All of that times the thickness of the slice, delta x. So I'll get volume of the slice is pi times the group. I'll get 100 minus the group over here, 100 uh, minus 10x cubed minus 10x cubed minus 20x cubed plus x to the sixth delta x. So, volume of an arbitrary particular slice is pi times, those will cancel, I'll get pi times 20x cubed minus x to the sixth delta x. So now I can go in and say, okay, the volume of the entire rotated region then, I'll pull the pi out and say it's the integral of 20x to the third minus x to the sixth with respect to x, which is going to give us pi times the root 20x to the fourth over 4, 5x to the fourth minus x to the seventh over 7. And, oh, I didn't put my definite integral here, but this needs to be from what to what? Zero to two. Yeah, because it's in terms of x. x goes from 0 to 2. So now I'll get this is pi times the group. Uh, 2 to the 4th is 16. 5 times 16 is 80. I'll get 80 minus 128 over 7. Of course, when I plug in a zero, I get a zero. Now, uh, 80 times 7 is 560. 560 minus 128 is going to be 432, I believe. 432 over 7. Seven surely not going to go into 432. Okay. Are these... Easier than they thought that than you thought that they would be, or harder than you thought they'd be so far? It's just because it's the practice test. <laughs> and the, the sad thing is, is you're believing. You're like, yeah, I know, that's true. But no, no. The one on the actual test is actually a linear. Imagine this is a cubic. And this is imagine how easy a linear would be. You are. <laughs> Just for that, I'll go back and change it. I've already printed them out. I don't think I'll be changing them. Change <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it like a cubic. It's a cubic. It's the same thing as a cube, isn't it? Oh, a cubic would be much or... uh, Okay, the last one is we're taking this region. Same region that ends at 2, 8, starts at 0, 0. But now we're taking this region and we're rotating about the line x equals negative 4. That's a vertical axis of revolution. Now, I don't want to show the rotation of this because it would take me probably over here to write on the paint. Uh, so I don't want to show the rotation in that direction, but I know it's going to be a shell. Uh, and the shells are going to go around, well, 
I'll, I'll, I won't. Uh, I said I won't, so I won't. Uh, but, but, they're, but they're going to go around that axis of revolution. And the important thing here is that you see, whether you draw out the rotation or not, that the radius of the rotation has to go from here to here. I'm going to call that my R value. So it's important that you get the correct R value in there. You could either say, well, just take the rightmost x value minus the leftmost x value. This x value is just x. It's the distance from the y-axis. So you could say x minus, what's this x value? Negative 4. So you literally could say x minus a negative 4 is your radius value, which, oh, that's x plus 4. Just looking at it and using common sense, you can also see it's x plus 4 because you can say wherever this shell is, it's at a distance of x from the y-axis. It's also at a, this, uh, this distance is always 4, so the distance from the axis of revolution is always 4 plus whatever the x value is as x goes from 0 to 2. So I'd say, what's the shortest radius in the problem? 4. What's the longest radius in the problem? 6, because x goes from 0 to 2. This accounts for all of those radi radial points. So I'll say, okay, when I look at an arbitrary shell, thickness is going to be delta x. The length of the shell is the circumference 2 pi r which we know in this case is 2 pi times x plus 4. The height of the shell is just the curve, which is our x cubed. So you'd say volume of a particular shell, that's going to be the width times the length times the height. So we can see, well, you could simplify that volume of the shell and say it's just 2 pi times the group x to the fourth plus 4x cubed delta x. So the volume of the entire rotated region is going to equal 2 pi times where the region starts in terms of x to work. So if you do all these as we're doing, shells for every vertical revolution, uh, slices for every horizontal axis revolution, you'll always be able to keep the limits of integration the same. Again, 0 to 2, and then it's just the integral of x to the fourth plus 4x cubed, dx. So we'll get 2 pi times the group, x to the fifth over 5, plus 4x to the 4th over 4, that'll just be x to the 4th, evaluated from 0 to 2. So I'll get 2 pi times 32 fifths plus 16. Sixteen, same thing as 80 over 5, 80 over 5 plus 32 over 5, 112 over 5, 112 times 2, 224 pi over 5. Do you care about a simple product? Oh, I care a lot. <coughs> That's mental math. But, <laughs> Say that again. Right. So, as you're working through these, or as we are working through these, uh, and you can kind of keep in mind for the test as well, 5 through 7 are going to be integration by parts. The next two are just trig integrals, section 7, 2. 
The next three are trig substitution. 10 through 12. Mm -hmm. And then the last two are the two techniques that we've looked at out of 7-5 so far. So the first one should be linear factors just to the first, and the second should be linear factors squared. Or linear, well, it is squared, but it could be to the third power, something like that. Uh, so, looking at number five, we Say that. Use the I still didn't hear you. Use the Oh, I thought you said you mean number six. It's like you don't want to look at number five. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. So, when I think about that, U equals Liate. So, when I think of what to let U equal, the algebraic function comes before the trig function, a before t. So when I integrate the integral x cosine 5x, you equal x. Yes, yes. u is equal to x, so du is dx. dv is cosine 5x. cc, cosine 5x dx. That was a... I noticed the book was messy on that. Uh, they, they didn't put their dx's in there, but then somehow they ended up in their integral anyway, in the solutions manual. Very sloppy notation. Uh, the v here, the integral of the cosine of 5x with respect to x. You said, well, if you integrate the cosine of 5x, working backwards, you say, well, the derivative of sine is cosine, so the integral of cosine is sine. And exactly, that's why I left a space in front. Then you'd say divided by the derivative of the angle, which is divided by five. I'd rather say multiply by one fifth in front. Uh, and we're good. So I'll say, and, and now you might be thinking, where's the plus c? That's going to go in at the end of the problem. Uh, and I can say this is technically correct because plus zero is a constant integration too. This is just a particular. Uh, so I'll say, okay, this integral of x cosine of 5x with respect to x, we can say is equal to u times v. Uh, that'll be x times 1 fifth sine of 5x. I'm just going to write that as x over 5 sine of 5x. That's my u times v minus the integral of v du. So that one-fifth, I'm going to go ahead and pull out in front and call it the integral of the sine of 5x dx. Now I can say I can integrate the sine of 5x with respect to x uh, just as it is. And so our answer is going to be x to the fifth sine of 5x. When I integrate the sine, I'm thinking, well, the integral of the sine is the negative of the cosine. That's what I can take the derivative of and get sine. So I integrate this and I get a negative cosine. It's going to make this a plus. When I integrate though, I'm also going to have to divide by 5. It's going to make this plus 1 25th cosine 5x. Then I'll put my plus c. Okay. If we didn't put the parentheses around the 5x, Doesn't no big deal. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, it's kind of weird that I use mixed notation. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. So. It'd be better to be consistent and either do it or not, rather than the way I have it. Uh, the integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x. What do you automatically recognize this problem as? Anytime you have an exponential function and a trigonometric function. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. So that, that's something I need you to see, guys. So your point of attack on this problem, it's not going to look any better after one uh, integration by parts. And you might think, well, well, I haven't helped any. If you use two integration by parts, I promise you, you'll end up with an <coughs> integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x on the right-hand side, which then you'll be able to algebraically manipulate and solve. So I, going into this problem, I know I'll have to use integration by parts twice, 
So I just know that up front. Then I'll be able to algebraically solve. When I do that, I'll say, well, I'm going to let u equal the trigonometric function. u equals the sine of 2x. So dv has to be everything else. It's e to the pi x dx. So if u is sine of 2x, then du, derivative of sine, cosine, 2x times 2. I'll go ahead and scrunch the 2 out in front. And this is with respect to x. Now, v, I have to integrate an exponential function. The integral of any exponential function is that exponential function divided by the derivative of its exponent. So v is going to be, I'll say, 1 over pi e to the pi x. Um, so I'll say, okay, done with the integral, ready to set up my integration by parts. I can say this integral e to the pi x sine of 2x dx is equal to u times v. This times this, I'll say, well, 1 over pi e to the pi x sine of 2x. All of that's u times v minus the integral v du. So let's go ahead and pull those constants out. I'll have 2 times 1 over pi. 2 over pi comes on the outside of the integral. On the integral of e to the pi x cosine 2x. Now unfortunately, here's where you think, well, I'm just working in a circle, but that's actually a good thing. We do integration by parts one more time, that'll be all that's needed. In this step, again, please let u be the trigonometric function. So this time, u is equal to the cosine of 2x. So dv is still e to the pi x dx. du derivative of cosine is going to be uh, negative sine, so I'll say it's negative 2 sine of 2x dx. v over here is the integral of this function, again 1 over pi e to the pi x. So I'll say, okay, on the left hand side I have the integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x dx is equal to 1 over pi e to the pi x sine x, sorry sine of 2x, minus 2 over pi times the group. What's in that group? The integral of this, which is u times v, that's going to give me 1 over pi e to the pi x cosine of 2x minus the integral of v du. But now notice, minus the integral, but that integral is going to have a negative in it. So I'll say that's plus 2 over pi. on the integral e to the pi x sine of 2x. So I can say, okay, what I'm getting is that this integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x dx is equal to 1 over pi e to the pi x sine 2x I'll distribute this minus 2 over pi to both of the terms in here. When I distribute it to the first term, I'll get minus 2 over pi squared e to the pi x cosine 2x minus 2 over pi times 2 over pi minus 4 over pi squared 
integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x dx. Here's our point where we have to use algebra. Please notice we have the integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x dx on the left. We have that same integral on the right. I need to get them on the same side. Also, I need to get a common denominator. So I could call this pi squared over pi squared. It's an understood one. So if you move the other group over here with it, the coefficient would be pi squared plus 4 over pi squared. Uh, now, what I'm going to do, I'm thinking, so it, it might, this is just to save me another step because I'm running out of room on the board, and you could do this on your test too. I'm thinking the coefficient would be pi squared plus 4 over pi squared. When I move that term over, that would be the coefficient of that group. So here's what I'm going to say. I'll say the integral of e to the pi x sine of 2x dx, that's what I'm trying to solve for. It would have, this is the coefficient, I would have to get rid of that coefficient in the next step by multiplying by the reciprocal of it anyway. So I'll say I know that this integral is equal to pi squared divided by pi squared plus 4 times what remained on this side, which are these two terms, uh, I'll say 1 over pi e to the pi x sine of 2x minus 2 over pi squared e to the pi x cosine of 2x. Plus c. Now, uh, if you wanted to factor there, you certainly could. They have a common factor of e to the pi x that could come out. Uh, you could also pull out a uh, 1 over pi squared if you wanted to. Oh, oh, ooh, that would be gorgeous if you did that. Because then that pi squared would cancel out the pi squared in the numerator. Yes. So I'll do that. I'll say I'll pull out an e to the pi x and a 1 over pi squared. That's going to give me e to the pi x. This is an, an optional step. So when you say, do you need to simplify beyond that? No, I would be happy. No, I would be satisfied with the previous answer. Happy with this answer. When I factor out that 1 over pi squared, that would leave this first term as a pi e to the pi, sorry, e to the pi is gone. Pi sine of 2x. The 1 over pi squared is gone, but I'll be left with a minus 2 cosine of 2x. I would say that's a gorgeous answer. I'd be happy with this answer. <laughs> if I get to there, I'll be happy. <laughs> so the next integration by parts problem, number seven. We have the integral of cosine x natural log of the sine of x dx. Okay, now, here's another thing that you can kind of tell yourself to prepare for my test. There will be three integration by parts problems. I try to make sure to account for the three basic scenarios. So the first problem, it'll be a direct integration by parts problem. You integrate by parts once, done. The second problem is going to be a cycle problem like the one we just worked. Uh, so you'll have to integrate by parts twice, algebraically solve, done. The third one will be an integration by parts that's used in combination with substitution. So you say, 
I know on the third integration by parts problem, it'll help if I use substitution first. What do you think the helpful substitution would be in this problem? Sine x. Yeah, it's an obvious one. You'd say, well, it's the argument of the logarithmic function. So you'd say, let u equal the sine of x. Ooh, since I'll use u as in my integration by parts, I would prefer to use t sub substitution. I'll say let t equal the sine of x. Then dt is going to be the cosine of x dx, which I have cosine of x dx right there. All of that's going to become dt. And so this problem is going to simplify with a substitution as the integral of the natural log of t dt. But you recall, we don't know, there is no basic integration formula for the natural log of t other than integration by parts. And in integration by parts, you say, well, u equals Lyotte, the very first thing you let it u equal is a logarithmic function. So I'll say, let u equal the natural log of t. Then dv has to be everything else in there. The only other thing in there is a 1 dt. Or you could just say dt. So if u is natural log of t, I don't know the integral right off the top of my head, but I do know the derivative. The derivative of any logarithmic function is 1 over what is it, what, what's in that function times the derivative of what's inside that function, dt. I can integrate 1 with respect to t and get a t. So that's telling me over here the natural sorry, the integral of the natural log of t dt is equal to u times v, t natural log of t, minus the integral of v du, but t and 1 over t eliminate, and I'm just left with the integral of dt, which again is the integral of 1 with respect to t. So I'll get t natural log of t minus t, plus the constant of integration. Now it's just uh, go back and substitute sine of x for t. So your answer is the sine of x times the natural log of the sine of x. Minus the sine of x plus c. I would warn you, I could foresee someone making a careless mistake and putting this as their answer. Do you see? the problem with that and why that's wrong, if not just me being nitpicky. This would be the sine of the natural, that's not the same thing. It's the sine of x times the natural log of the sine of x minus the sine of x plus c. Oh, that would actually make it a little easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, you could say sine of x times the group natural log of sine of x minus 1 plus c. I agree. Okay, now, number eight and nine. Please note, uh, the, the solutions manual is several problems out of seven, two. They would go to those horrendous formulas for stuff like this. I would not allow that on test. So we have to know our trigonometry to go be able to go in and simplify this in order to use the calculus. So, for my number eight here, it's saying integrate the sine to the fifth of x with respect to x. Anytime you have an, so we need to remember, anytime you have an odd power of a sine or cosine, the techniques we talked about in class are, you need to take all but one power of that and turn it into a cosine function. So you say, well, I can say sine to the fifth, <laughs> so this is just thinking about it. Take all but one power of it and write it as a cosine function. So sine, of, uh, sine to the fourth x times sine of x. Sine to the fourth is nothing more than sine squared x quantity squared. 
And I know that sine squared Pythagorean formula says sine squared plus cosine squared is one, thus cosine squared is, or sorry, thus uh, sine squared is one minus cosine squared. So I'll say this is the group one minus cosine squared squared times the sine of x. Now, do we have to write all that out, or? No. Okay. No. I'm just trying to show my thinking. Now, when I square this out, I'll get 1 minus 2 cosine squared x, negative cosine squared times negative cosine squared plus cosine to the fourth. This is what I needed. So I'll say this integral is equivalent to the integral of 1 minus 2 cosine squared x plus cosine to the fourth x times the sine of x dx. This is where we can say, well, now it's just an easy u substitution. Let u equal the cosine of x, and we know that du would equal the negative of the sine of x with respect to x. I don't have the negative of the sine of x dx, so I know I could multiply by a negative 1 on the inside and outside and get it. This is going to become the negative of the integral 1 minus 2u squared plus u to the fourth. All of this is du. So now I can do my integration. This becomes the negative of the group u minus 2u cubed over 3 plus u to the fifth over 5 plus the constant of integration. We're done with the problem other than back substituting cosine x as u. So my final answer is going to be the negative of the cosine of x plus two-thirds cosine cubed x minus one-fifth cosine to the fifth x plus the constant integration. Now I think you're thinking, hey, that's kind of a fun problem. I agree. Number nine. So, number nine, I was a little, slightly bit mean, because in addition to using the power reduction formula, we also have to worry about the multiple of the angle at the same time. So that, that's kind of cool. You said mean. <laughs> uh, cool and mean kind of go together on this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, it would be nicer if I just said cosine to the fourth of x, and it's especially it could be misleading because you might, I started to say you might get the fours mixed up, but as long as you remember to put a fourth power and a four on the x, it's okay. Uh, so this is number nine, integral of cosine to the fourth of four x dx. So as I work with that, I need to be thinking of the rules up at the top, the power reduction formulas that we saw in tree. Uh, and so you'd say, well, I know that cosine squared x is one half times the group, one plus the cosine of twice the angle. So I have cosine to the fourth of four x. So I can say, well, cosine to the fourth of 4x four is equal to cosine squared of 4x quantity squared. I need to work the inside part first. So I'll say, well, the inside part, and I'll just go ahead and think about it like this, it's going to be some group, and I'll have to square it. The inside part, cosine squared of 4x, that's my formula. It's going to be 1 half times the group, 1 plus the cosine of twice the angle, now everything in this group is squared, just like the cosine squared 4x was squared, so this is going to give us 
one fourth, and then this group is squared, so it's multiplied by itself. So I'd say whenever I multiply one plus cosine eight x times one plus cosine eight x, I'll have to foil it out and I'll get one plus two cosine eight x. Cosine eight x times cosine eight x, cosine squared eight x. But now you're looking and saying, you, you cannot integrate cosine squared. Nope, I have to use the power reduction formula again. So I'll go through, distribute the one-fourth to these terms, and actually the last term too. I'll get one-fourth plus one-half cosine 8x. Now, what I want to do is I want to distribute one-fourth and use that power reduction formula at the same time. I already know the power reduction formula is going to say this is going to become one half times the group one plus cosine sixteen x. So why not go ahead and take that one half that would be out in front of it, multiply it by one fourth, one half times one fourth. I'll get one over eight times the group one plus the cosine of twice that angle, like that. So now I'm ready to simplify. 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. That's 2 over 8 plus 1 over 8, 3 over 8. That's great. Plus 1 half cosine 8x. Plus 1 over 8, the cosine of 16x. It's the trig in this problem that makes it beautiful. The calculus isn't that fun because once you get to this you can just say okay so my original problem the integral of the fourth power of the cosine of 4x dx it's equal to the integral of 3 eighths plus 1 half cosine 8x plus 1 eighth cosine of 16x And so now when we integrate, you go to it term by term. The integral of 3 eighths with respect to x, 3 eighths x. The integral of 1 half cosine 8x, so you say, well, I know that the integral of the cosine is the sine. Whenever I integrate a trig function that has a multiple angle, you're going to have to divide by the derivative of that angle as well. So this is going to be plus 1 half sine of 8x divided by 8, 1 16th <coughs> sine of 8x. Same thing on the next one. You say, well, the integral of cosine is sine. I'll also have to divide by 16. I guess it's checking to make sure I remembered, Brian, that 16 times 8 is 128 plus 1 over 128 sine of 16x plus 